The United States and its new Africa strategy. What's driving it? What does it involve? And will it impact China's relationship with Africa? Hello, I'm Arnold Naidu, and this is The Heat. Over the last two decades, the levels of trade and investment between China and Africa have increased significantly. According to Chinese government figures, China's total import and export volume with Africa exceeded $204 billion last year. China is also engaged in major investment and infrastructure projects on the African continent. And last September, Chinese President Xi Jinping announced more good economic news. China. China is willing to provide another $60 billion in support to Africa through government assistance, investment and financing of financial institutions and enterprises. Meanwhile, the United States' trading relationship with Africa has declined over the last decade, down from $142 billion in 2008 to about $62 billion in 2018. But last December, the U.S. administration started rolling out what it's calling a new Africa strategy. National Security Advisor John Bolton attacked China's engagement with Africa and insisted America will be a better partner for Africans. We want our economic partners in the region to thrive, prosper and control their own destinies. In America's economic dealings, we ask only for reciprocity, never for subservience. The United States is now promoting efforts to engage with African business leaders. There is much to discuss, so let's get to our panel. With me here in the studio is David Shin. He's a former U.S. ambassador to Ethiopia, and he's an adjunct professor of international affairs at George Washington University. Joining us from Cape Town, South Africa, is Sanusha Naidu. She is a foreign policy analyst at the Institute for Global Dialogue. With us, too, from Nairobi, Kenya, is Ken Gishinga. He's the managing director and chief economist at Mentoria Economics. And from Beijing, we're joined by Victor Gao. He is a CGTN commentator and vice president of the Center for China and Globalization. Welcome to all of you to the show. Ambassador Shin, let's start right here in the studio. Uh, a United States delegation met with African business leaders in the Southeast African state of Mozambique last month. And at that meeting, uh, the U.S. delegation urged African business leaders to ramp up trade with the United States. It's all done under the banner of what is known as the Prosper Africa program. What is your assessment of that effort? I think there are uh, two reasons why the administration has adopted this Prosper Africa program. One is to focus less on aid uh, to Africa and more on trade and investment. And this is uh, one way to try to do that, to stay engaged on the continent, uh, but to do it in a different form. The second reason is uh, competition with China and to a much lesser extent Russia. Uh, this is uh, a way I think the administration sees of being able to compete more effectively on the continent. The, the problem with all of this is that we have very different uh, systems of economics and politics in the United States and China. In the United States, it's all based on the private sector. The private sector will make its own decisions as to whether it's going to trade and invest in Africa. And you can make changes on the margins if you are the administration and pushing very hard to engage uh, the private sector, but ultimately they will decide on the basis of profit whether they're going to go in or not. So whether there's a significant change or not in the years to come is, in my view, rather questionable. All right, let me bring in Sanusha Naidu. She's in Cape Town in South Africa. Sanusha, the amount of money that has been pledged by the United States under this program is $50 million. That's a relatively small amount of money. Besides, if we look at the delegation that was sent to Mozambique, it did not include any senior official, any cabinet-level official from the United States. So what does this tell us about how serious the United States is about expanding trade relations with uh, the African continent? Thank you, Anand. I think that's a very important statistic to raise because if you look at the China-Africa Forum that took place last year, the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, you saw 60 billion in terms of pledges that were raised uh, at that summit. Now, obviously, there's been challenges around whether the amount has increased from 2015 as the summit is hosted every three years. But I do think that there are other avenues in which we can see the kinds of investments that are coming in from China. And I think the challenge for 
uh, countries like the U.S. and perhaps even Britain as we consider the Brexit and in terms of uh, actors like India as well, I think the challenge for them is trying to maintain the kind of economic presence and footprint by the rollout of the kind of investment and trade we're seeing. We have seen a dip in the Chinese trade with Africa since 2014, going down to about $148 billion. Uh, if you look at a, t a total trade between the U.S. and China, it's around about just under $40 billion if my uh, statistics are correct. But I do think that that in itself tells you also it's not just about the game changer. It's not just about the fact that you've got to raise the ante in terms of the economic um, money that, that you outline or outlay, but rather it's also backed up by diplomacy, and in particular economic diplomacy. And I think the Chinese have been very good in the way that they're fashioned out of policy around economic diplomacy towards African countries. We may not agree with some of it. We may have to still unpack and assess the implications of how this diplomacy is put into practice, but it definitely uh, follows the trend in terms of how the Chinese adapt to the kinds of situations in Africa. And of course, uh, the challenges do remain, but at the same time, I think we have to also start thinking about what does this mean for African agency and how Africa is actually defining its, its agency in the relationships that are now co coming out and these reactions we are seeing by countries like the U.S. trying to re re reformulate themselves and recalibrate themselves, but also at the same time, what is the, the African response. Ambassador, what do you make of that point there, that the United States also has to raise its economic diplomatic engagement with the continent? Well, I think that's accurate. Uh, it does have to do so. And I, I think the administration believes that in its view it is doing just that. Uh, the fact remains, though, that we have, uh, the United States has relatively few representatives of the Department of Commerce assigned to Africa. They've increased the number slightly, but not significantly. Uh, and the, the numbers just don't bear out uh, that there has been a, any kind of a significant increase. Having said all of that, in terms of investment stock in Africa today, I think it's fair to say there's more American investment stock in Africa than there is Chinese investment stock, mainly because the U.S. started earlier. Uh, investment, annual investment flows to Africa today are probably about equal between the United States and China. China probably is ahead in certain years and the U.S. ahead in other years. So the U.S. is still engaged in terms of investment. Trade has gone down uh, significantly for the United States, but it's, as Sanusha said, it's also gone down for China. Let's go to Victor in Beijing. And Victor, when the uh, United States National Security Advisor John Bolton unveiled America's new Africa strategy, uh, that was last December, he was very critical of China and critical of Russia as well. Let's listen to what he had to say. The predatory practices pursued by China and Russia stunt economic growth in Africa, threaten the financial independence of African nations, inhibit opportunities for U.S. investment, interfere with U.S. military operations, and pose a significant threat to U.S. national security interest. That was the U.S. national Secur security advisor there, John Bolton. And Victor, uh, there's been some commentary uh, since then that this move by the United States could signal a new Cold War, or it could be a new battleground in this trade war that's currently underway between the United States and China. Well, allow me to make several brief observations. Uh, first of all, purely from the African country's perspective, the more foreign investment into Africa uh, should be welcomed, either from China or from the United States. Uh, therefore, from the Chinese perspective, we welcome more countries, including the United States, to make real investment in Africa, which can promote a development of the African countries. Secondly, for any country to be involved in Africa, if you want to really compete with other countries by vilifying the other country, by bad-mouthing the other country, it will not work. Why? Because the African countries and the African brothers and sisters are very smart and intelligent. They will know what you are talking about. They will know whether you talk the right talk and walk the right walk. What the African brothers and sisters need is the real money to be invested, which will promote their connectivity and promote their productivity. That's the only thing that will count. You know, whether a country's activities in Africa have a direct bearing on U.S. or any other third country, non-African countries, 
that's not the relevant point. I think the African countries care about their own development, care how to lift their people out of poverty and move on to manufactured, uh, more industrialized uh, economies, for example. And I would say China will continue to do the right thing. That is to treat the African brothers and sisters completely as equal and share our experience. And also, very importantly, put the real money, including both debt and equity, to the right use in Africa. All right. Ken Gashenga, China's trade and economic engagement with Africa has risen very sharply over the last decade. And as we've just heard, U.S. trade uh, with uh, the African continent has dropped. Since, nine, since 2014, it's dropped by about a third. Uh, so how much of a challenge would it be for the United States now in terms of expanding trade with the African continent to, to expand that, to play catch up, really? Well, <clears throat> there is an increasing realization that the world has become a different place. Uh, there was a time when the Washington consensus, the IMF and the World Bank, really dictated uh, political economy in Africa. But with the rise of Russia, um, India, Brazil, China, the world is a much more different place. And you've absolutely correctly pointed out that Sino-African relationships have increasingly grown over the last decade. And uh, the US uh, is, in a way, playing catch up. Um, China identified that there's an infrastructure deficit in Africa and has committed uh, over $60 billion to supporting that. Uh, now, the US, uh, well, you remember in 2015 when Barack Obama visited uh, Kenya in 2015, there was that realization that America needs to step up its initiatives in Africa. Uh, but we are not seeing the amount of dollars um, coming to Africa in the same way that we are seeing uh, dollars coming from China, for example. So in a sense, we are still seeing African countries facing east, and I think that might continue until the terms of uh, reference actually change. Basil, what do you make of that, that uh, I guess the global architecture, the uh, balance of power to some extent has changed, and what we're seeing now is a reflection of that? Well, th that's true. Uh, I, would, I would agree with that. Uh, I would make the point, however, that we have to be a little bit careful in terms of how we compare numbers. Uh, we use the $60 billion figure uh, rather loosely in, in terms of what came out of the last FOCAC meeting in, in Beijing. Uh, in terms of in looking at that money, most of that is financing. It's, it's basically loans, loans that have to be paid back. Uh, most United States engagement in Africa over the last decade or so has been in the form of grant aid, about $8 billion annually. That doesn't have to be paid back. That's, that's grant money. Uh, so we're talking sometimes about apples and oranges uh, when, we, when we look at these numbers. It's true that there's far more Chinese money flowing into Africa today than there is American money flowing in. But it is very important to look at what it is and what it constitutes. What do you make of that, Victor? That's uh, a, an important difference there, that the money that goes from the United States to African countries goes in the form of grants. They don't have to pay it back. But in the case of China, these are loans which these countries have to pay back. There have been allegations, accusations, that China is actually leaving these African countries with deep, deep debt, a debt trap to some extent. No, first of all, I think uh, grants uh, are important to many African countries, and both China and the United States are providing grants. However, grants provided by the United States, in all objectivity, are really like small sesames. And the grants provided by the Chinese government are actually probably much larger than that granted by the U.S. government. So we do not need to confuse the concept. However, I think grants cannot work miracles in African countries. You need to really combine a much more sophisticated package of solutions, including, for example, grants or low-interest debt and commercial debt, for example, and also, very importantly, equity money. So eventually, what will solve the problems in Africa, what will really help the African brothers and sisters to uplift themselves from poverty and move on to industrialization, for example, will need much more than pure grants, even though grants are in themselves very important. And I hope 
both China and the United States and any other more developed countries in the world will really make the determination and make the commitment to provide more capital, more investments, more technologies, and more manufacturing capacities to many African countries. And eventually, the African people will really be the benefit, beneficiary of such investments. So, Nusha Naidu, we have heard the United States and others accuse China of using debt and what's been termed a colonial approach in Africa. But South Africa's president, Cyril Ramaphosa, he has responded to that, uh, and this is what he had to say. Let's listen. Falkirk refutes the view that a new colonialism is taking hold in Africa, as our detractors would have us believe. So, Sanusha, how do you see China's involvement uh, in Africa? How does it differ from that of the United States? Let me, let me just make one point, just in terms of the discussion thus far, Anand, and that is the question that hasn't really come out and hasn't been discussed, and that is, we are assuming that Africa is passive. Yes, I understood the point that there's engagement between the U.S. and China. There's questions of grant and what's tied aid and what's development finance and, and so forth. But if you take, for example, what President Ramaphosa is saying and you actually disaggregate or unpack it, I think what the messaging is is that for the first time, we are actually taking or taking control of this relationship. Whereas when you start to present it in the kinds of very narrow parochial terminology of imperialist, neo-colonialist, or a colonial pattern of trade, then you start getting into the very uh, 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 discussion around who's good and who's bad. This is not a testosterone fight. This is about Africa and Africa's development. The other point about this is that we also have to start employing on our, our, our African leaders to try and secure the best deals. If this world has changed, as we rightly, all of our colleagues on, on the panel agree, that the dynamics of the global uh, structure has shifted, that the realities of the dynamics of the power structures have shifted, the world is no longer, as we see it in 1945. Institutionally and multilaterally, we've seen shifts in these institutions and the multi multilateral dimension of the world. Then the question really is about the African agency. And what I don't get out of this debate by we try to compartmentalize it into debates of whether it's a neo-colonialism or it's a new dynamic of Cold War, etc., is the African agency. Now, we've had particular itch issues in Africa in the last several uh, days, weeks, etc., around the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. We have people talk about the fact that industrialization is going to take us forward and we have to be part of the fourth industrial revolution, otherwise we'll get left behind. There's a number of dynamics that are actually present in the African continent structurally that we need to think about. Structurally, if you take the, the, the number of the total trade between China and the African continent made up of 54 or depending if you want to call 55 states, it's not it's not uh, magnificent in terms of that. It's negligible. And you look at the economies of scale. What we really need in this engagement is to understand how that industrialization is going to integrate Africa into the global value chain and be able to export to markets where there are tariffs, both into the U.S. market right. and into the Chinese market. Okay. Uh, Ken Gishinga, to Sanusha's point about the fact that uh, African countries are not just passive observers in this process. In fact, uh, to a large extent, they are now able to dictate the terms of their relationship with the rest of the world. Uh, the Washington Post had a piece not so long ago in which it said that the United States' message to African countries is very blunt and it's very clear. Choose the United States over China and Russia. So to what extent uh, are we seeing a super, well, maybe superpower rivalry on the continent? Well, you really have to think about the macroeconomic situation. Um, the economy, the GDP of Africa, the entire African continent is smaller than the GDP of France. So there's always been that realization that Africa has been punching way below its weight in terms of global affairs. But that seems to be changing because Africa is now the home of the world's most natural resources. It's the home of the next uh, demographic dividends. So in a sense, um, Africa is stepping up to the table and increasingly it's looking for win-win relationships with the US, with China, and uh, with Russia and all the other uh, emerging markets. So right now, the scramble for Africa in a sense 
It's almost looking for Africa as the next market opportunity, and it's time that other superpowers started um, treating Africa in, within those terms of references. Ambassador, if we look at uh, how Africa is being treated by the United States, in fact, the rest of the world, the Trump uh, administration is driven by a make America great again philosophy and a rejection of globalization. It also refutes the idea of multilateralism. How will those very, I guess, broad approaches affect uh, trade relations, economic relations with Africa? Well, first off, I'm not here to defend the uh, Trump administration's policy on Africa. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm troubled by some aspects of it. Uh, nevertheless, I think that the idea of more investment and more trade, whether it's from the U.S., China, or any other country, is a good thing. And I think all of us on the panel probably agree with that. I also think that the concept of uh, better, greater African agency, again, whether you're talking about China, the United States, or somebody else, is, uh, is important. So in, in that sense, there's agreement. Uh, as far as the, uh, the administration's policy of dealing with it uh, today, uh, as I implied earlier, I think there are some, some elements of that that are just not going to work, uh, primarily because of the American system of uh, economics and politics. It, it's simply totally dependent upon the private sector, and you can only make changes at the margins at the governmental level. Uh, and otherwise, it's just going to happen as it will. Victor Gao, it would appear that China has one advantage uh, over the United States, or for that matter, uh, many parts of the world, when it comes to engagement with Africa, in that it's, uh, it's part of the BRICS uh, coalition, the BRICS uh, agreement among five countries. It's also created the AIIB, the Asia Investment and Infrastructure Bank, and many African countries are members of that bank. So does that give China a significant advantage? Well, of course, these uh, new institutions or new frameworks really help both China and many other particip participating countries. Now, allow me to mention one point. That is, I think, between China and the United States, both countries need to treat the African countries as equals and show the African people with due respect. And you cannot treat the relations as, you know, lopsided. Uh, I understand many African heads of states during their visit to the United States cannot even line up a visit to the White House. That is really a shame. They do not get equal treatment from the head of state in the United States. Whereas, allow me to emphasize, every time every head of state or head of government of any African country coming to China will be treated equally as the head of state of any other countries in the world. This is the equality of treating African countries, their government leaders, as well as their people with respect and with dignity. And I hope this kind of respect and decency and dignity will prevail also eventually in the U.S. attitude in dealing with the African countries. I think this is the more important criteria than, for example, how much grant money you provide or not. Because if you do not treat African countries and the African brothers and sisters as equal, you always miss the point. You do not know how to really engage with Africa. Sanusha, uh, the United States National Security Advisor, uh, John Bolton, he's also directed a lot of his criticism at uh, Russia. In fact, later this year, Russia uh, will play host to a Russia-Africa summit in Sochi in Russia. How deep is the Russian involvement in Africa right now, and how do you see that evolve? Well, Alan, I think you know, what's interesting about this year is that the summit actually is preceded by a number of different initiatives. Just recently, there was a parliamentary uh, summit that, was that has taken place in Russia with regard to African legislatures and legislatures coming in, in and, 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 and being part of that kind of engagement. I think to a large extent, we've got to also think about some of the geostrategic interests that have come into the continent post the, 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 the formation of BRICS uh, and how that has actually played itself out within the African continent. For me personally, I think that uh, I would like to see a more emboldened Africa in these different uh, initiatives, in these different structures. I, I, I think that as much as uh, there needs to be a respect of the engagement, I think, and an equality. But I also think that there needs to be a terms of reference that Africa can put down on the table. And that, I think, hasn't really come out in terms of the traction. 
so in terms of Russia, there's, there's, there's different interpretations about what Russia's intentions are in Africa and whether or not it's a kind of revisionist kind of approach to, to the way in which uh, Russia may want to recreate some of its engagements. What I find interesting is, is that uh, very often when you, you have these kinds of geostrategic uh, uh, interests that are realigning some of these uh, areas around the, 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 the world that we are living in currently, uh, very often we come back to Africa as a kind of legitimating process. For me personally, I think what we have to be very cautious and careful of is that uh, we have to distinguish between how the elites perceive these, the, this relationship, whether it's with the US or China or India or Russia, whoever uh, that, that, that is crafting these external partnerships with Africa, and how is it perceived in terms of public opinion across the African continent. And I think very often we tend to subsume and assume a political perception is actually the overall perception. And that's very uh, uh, misleading in, 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 what, in the work that we've done. I think that African uh, citizenry, people across the African continent are very aware of how much of the resources that are being used in these, in, in whether or not it's the, the industrialization, uh, going towards levels of, 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 of higher level of production, etc., are not necessarily coming back in terms of benefits. And I think we have to be very prepared about how these changes at the domestic level may take place. So as I say this as well, I would actually say that my point about agency was that it's not just about what the African elites do in their visits to these capitals or to these cities or to these countries. It's about the terms of reference. And of course, that means a, a two-way trade has to be about a, enabling access in both markets okay. and be able to export and import in the way that we want, particularly in, in, in terms of global value chains. Ken Gishinga, one last point, and that is if the United States is to succeed with this program in Africa, what are some of the areas where it might be able to do that? Where do the opportunities lie? I think the traditional view that um, the only thing that Africa can produce is uh, natural resources in gold, in oil, and copper, I think that traditional view has to be debunked. And I think we have to look at the real competitive of advantage in Africa is the human capital. You have young, well-educated Africans who can participate in innovation. So if the US really wanted to have a deeper engagement in Africa, it has to stop being about exporting coffee and tea to the US. It has to be about knowledge sharing, knowledge exchange. You know, how, how does Africa contribute to the thinking of 5G? How does Africa contribute to artificial intelligence? You know, how, what is the next big thing in terms of the fourth industrial revolution for the human people, for the human capital in Africa? That doesn't get enough time, that kind of narrative. And I think it's about time we started looking at Africa from the human capital perspective and strengthening human capital. And that's where we have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for being with us. And we are going to have to leave it there. Thanks for joining us.